Okay, thanks for that very rather generous and kind introduction. And if I can, actually I have, if you can allow me to share my screen, because it says that it, the host, can I please request that you can allow me to share my screen? Because when I try to share it, it says the host has disabled. One second, sir. Okay, I guess, I mean, that's while we get things sorted, uh, I should start by thanking Asmita and others for giving me this opportunity to share and present some of my work. And given the, okay, so now I can share my screen. So that's good. Let me. I should start with, I listened to all the opening remarks and I got to say that I have to start with a disclaimer that I will bring you, you know, back down to something that's not very technology driven, but something very, very fundamental. Uh, so we, uh, so my, my group is at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and we are very interested in understanding how cells divide. Uh, of course, I mean, because of COVID period and all. I mean, we uh, sort of a small branch of my lab also works on, uh, you know, actively is working on how to devise some much cheaper methods of COVID-19 testing using a single step PCR method, but that's not something that I'm going to talk about, but that's closest to any form of innovation that, that our group come, uh, I mean, works on. We basically, we work on a very, very fundamental aspect of cell division. And I will take you through uh, some of what, uh, what we do today. Uh, so this slide actually shows a dividing uh, sea urchin uh, cell during its first division. And you can see uh, that all animal cells like these sea urchin cells, when uh, at the time of division, what it does, it actually partitions the chromosome uh, to the two ends of the cell and then a contractile force, which consists of actin, filaments, myosin molecule, and various other molecules assembled in the middle of the cortex. Uh, once these chromosomes are segregated, uh, this cortex needs to know that it's time to divide, and it contracts and pulls down the membrane uh, or the furrow as, as this contraction happens. And there are wide, uh, there are li large number of components that contribute to this division. First, of course, is this actomycin structure, which is often called actomycin ring or contractile ring. Systems. Then there are the matrix. So, I mean, this is an age old problem. I mean, people have observed uh, the, these processes uh, almost two, uh, a decade, uh, a century and a half ago. Uh, but we are still sort of getting to the real mechanistic insights into how this process works. Uh, how does the cell know? What, how does it assemble this contractile structure? And how does that contractile structure function in the molecular details? That's, that's what our lab is, uh, is deeply interested in. And we look at this process on various systems, but most, most of the time, we use a very simple unicellular organism, the Fisionis, Saccharomyces pombi, um, which like animal cells actually divide by assembling uh, these actomycin structure that divides the cell post anaphase into two. Uh, we also work quite extensively on animal cell, but because of the interest in the interest of time, I won't uh, quite get into those. Uh, these are obvious reasons why Fisionese makes a very really good uh, model system and it's very really attractive, but it's fissile genetics as well as, uh, I mean, the kind of sophisticated manipulations that you can do with it uh, stands out as one of the major reasons why uh, you use the system, besides the fact, of course, that the process of division is conserved. Uh, so almost three decades ago, uh, starting with some pioneering work 
done by uh, Paul Nurses Group and others in 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 Pombe, at, when they had carried out a, a wide scale genetic screen, had identified a large number of genes, actually 25, 26 of them, which were essential for the process of division. It was uh, later uh, in a decade or two, uh, many of those orthologs in humans were also discovered and found to be equally important for the process of division. And these molecules include molecule like trophilin, uh, myosin, uh, which is an actin-based motor, uh, uh, formins, which nucleates actin, uh, some of the membrane-associated molecules, uh, type 2 myosin, myosin light chain, uh, actin filament itself, uh, and actin regulatory proteins like cofilin, ICAP, uh, and others. So then this slide, uh, actually shows you how exactly a POMB cells divide. Uh, so once these cells enter into mitosis, uh, it forms an actomycin ring rather early. And upon formation of this ring, these, these rings, once they are formed, they wait for almost about uh, one fourth of its cell cycle before the anaphase is completed. And once anaphase is completed, this ring actually In this is right. So the kind of questions that we are, so, I mean, the field over the last, uh, you know, I mean, uh, 15 to 20 years have already made enormous process, uh, progress in understanding this process. We have a fairly good parts list of this. We know in, in, in Pombe, there are precisely 143 molecules, 143 different proteins, which, uh, are a component of these actomycin contractile structure. In mammalian cells, the numbers are slightly larger. They are about 200, uh, 200 uh, actually more, slightly more than 200 of such proteins. Uh, so, so we have fairly good parts list, but what we don't quite understand fully well is uh, how exactly that do these components come together? Uh, how does the cell find a middle? That's a question that we and others also address quite extensively, though for this talk, we won't get into it. What's the ulcer structure of this thing, as well as what drives contractions? So where does the force come from? And I'll touch upon some of these uh, during my uh, talk today. So again, uh, just to show you how exactly these things are formed. Uh, so what you see is uh, a, a, a 3D projected movie of a POMB cell dividing. So it's a cylindrically shaped cell. So this would be the outline of the cell. And uh, rather early in its uh, mitosis, and what you see in green is the regulatory light chain of myosin, which throughout my talk, I'll use it as a surrogate marker for the actomycin structure. Uh, what is seen in red is the spindle pole body, which is the centrosome equivalent of animal cell. And when these red dot, a single, what you see now is a single red dot, but that will separate into two and that's the entry into mitosis. That's when the DNA of, of, of these uh, cells will actually con congregate first and then separate into anaphase. And these uh, separated dots will then move to the two ends of the cell and concomitant with that, you will see an actomycin ring form in the middle, right? So you see now these two dots are separated. This cell is in very, very early anaphase. And these myosin structure, which was in the medial cortex, is, be is beginning to swell into a, what looks like a lariat-like structure, which will further congress into a ring-like structure. So right now, you can see that it's already a, a, a nicely formed ring. And this thing, once it's formed, will actually stay put till these two red dots hit the end of the cell. And only and only then, only and only when the uh, DNA is segregated, will this begin to constrict. So it waits now, and now, now is the time when it starts to constrict. And as it constricts, it actually lays down the circuit deposit. So if you, if you take a top-down view of 
of this contraction. So this is an ingressing in, in very, uh, followed by membrane, which is stained by FM464, it's a membrane staining dye. And since uh, these uh, pommy cells are, are wall material, then uh, you also see this cell wall being deposited uh, that actually follows or traces uh, this ingressing membrane deposition. Uh, and in the chymograph, you can see how nicely these things actually constrict. And as it constricts, it's from pushed down from there. So I'll, I'll sort of, I won't get into very specific details of, of these process because, uh, I mean, since it's a more generic talk, but I'll give you some brief flavors of the kind of different techniques and technologies that we use to understand this process. And the first thing is, uh, so, as I mentioned that, I mean, of course, uh, the, the, the inventory of, of the, these components are already known, but we can't, don't really fully understand how these things are organized, what triggers contraction, what powers contraction, and how this whole process is coordinated. So, so one of the approach that is very common, very popular with most of the model system is to take a simple forward genetic approach. And uh, you know, I mean, that's something that uh, people like Nurse Lab, uh, uh, Fred Chang's group, Mohan Balasubramanian's group, I mean, uh, uh, Kathy Gould and others have taken similar approaches to to do uh, for genetic screens. And of course, I mean, the, one of the introductory slides that I showed you that they've identified about twenty five different uh, genes which are absolutely critical and essential for the process. So we also. Uh, uh, had carried out a similar screen, but we did a saturation screen because uh, to, to look for other molecules which is not isolated from this screen. And one such molecule that came out of our screen was this so-called ring 4 uh, mutant. Uh, so unlike wild type cells, so these are wild type cells, uh, wild type pombe cells, these are post anaphase. So you see that uh, the DNA has already been segregated. Uh, in red, what you see is spindle. And you can see these actomycin rings nicely formed in these anaphase cells. In these mutants, uh, they really struggle to form these rings. These, all these cells are post-anaphase. Uh, and you can see that most of these cells, uh, the actomycin structures are rather diffuse or uh, you know, formed in form of cables or, or myriad of uh, you know, structures, but they can't quite assemble into a nice ring-like structure. So Aditi in the lab um, sort of characterized this genetically cloned it, uh, but unfortunately, I mean, this mutant is not completely lethal, so she had to uh, do some uh, very intricate genetic tricks like chromosome mapping and all to figure out what, what this particular mutation was. And then finally she cloned it and she found that this mutation, it's a very, very subtle A to V uh, mutation, a single point mutation in a protein uh, called Enelin uh, uh, called uh, uh, N1 in, in Pompey. This is an actin cross-linking protein, uh, which is uh, conserved in all organism. And not only the protein is conserved, but actually this particular uh, amino acid is actually conserved throughout all organism. Uh, again, I mean, uh, based on lots of genetics as well as uh, I mean, modeling studies in collaboration with uh, Ravi Venkatramani's lab, uh, who works in the chemical department, uh, chemistry department of TIFR, uh, we figure we map this particular mutation uh, to a domain of act to the actin interacting domain of this particular protein. So what AN1 does, it's it's an alpha actinin, and it glues actin filaments together. So it, it is a dimeric protein. As you can see here, it has actin binding domain. Uh, so so it, it, it forms a, an inverse dimer with two actin binding domains at the two ends of these cells. And the mutation actually lies in this actin binding domain. And when we uh, uh, do some uh, dynamic simulations, and when we place these on these actin filaments, these mutation on the actin filament, uh, we can see and uh, we can understand as how this glue Actually, what N1, this kind of mutation does is it does not loosen this uh, actin bundling or binding property, but it actually tightens. I mean, the, the, the model predicted that it actually tightens these actin bundling uh, filament, right? And that uh, sort of explains as why we didn't, or why people didn't find this mutation in uh, 
early genetic screens. Um, and, and that prediction we sort of validated using biochemical analysis. I mean, because of the interest of time, again, I will not get into it. Uh, so what, what I'm trying to tell you is that actin filaments need to form. These actin filaments are actually numerous in uh, uh, at the Actum, uh, at the, the actomycin ring. So we know that the estimate is that there are about uh, 4,000 such actin filaments that come together to and assemble into a ring. And I'll show you some of the ultrastructure of uh, how these actin filaments look. Uh, uh, so, but what, uh, what we found was that uh, this particular mutation actually tightens these actin filament bundling even more which means that they are not dynamic enough, not quite dynamic enough, and hence these cells actually fail into, uh, into forming and assembling a proper thing. And this, as well as, uh, I mean, some other, some of our other works uh, based on actin bundling, protein, uh, actin severing protein cofilin, uh, had helped us sort of come uh, to a working model where by this uh, protein called MED1 in the, in the medial cortex. Uh, these form in chisel as well as cross-linked uh, in a dynamic fashion uh, by this aniline-like protein, uh, uh, which is link 4, and that helps uh, to assemble these links uh, properly in, in the cortex as it should be. Right? So that's, that's one flavor of the lab where we use genetics to understand how, how this whole process occurs. Uh, in collaboration with Grant Jensen's lab at, at Caltech, uh, we have actually also started look, taking a very close look at uh, these actomycin link structures. So exactly how they look like, what is the topology, what are the different molecules, uh, and what are the arrangement of different molecules. And, and uh, we did this work in collaboration with, Grant, uh, with Matt, uh, who was then uh, with, with in the Jensen lab. Uh, since then, Mayat has now uh, started his own independent group at, at UPenn, and we continue to collaborate uh, very, very closely in, in uh, sort of uh, making progress in, in this uh, particular field. And a graduate student uh, in the lab, Shamu, uh, worked closely with Matt to, to look at this. So I, I believe most of you know what electron tomography is. Uh, and again, I mean, uh, I would not quite have the time to get into this uh, this process, but if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer it. So what, what we do essentially is do a correlative fluorescence and uh, uh, electron microscopy. So we take cells, we synchronize them, uh, and we catch them in this phase where most of these cells, or at least 70 to 80% of these cells are in early anaphase where they have already assembled these actomycin structure. And we sort of go and look at these structures in minute uh, molecular details. Uh, so we first uh, isolate these structures in, in fluorescent microscope, go back and take them out on, uh, on, on, on the tomogram, do thick, thin sectioning. And we then we look uh, at them under the, uh, under the cryo electron tomogram. And, and this is what we typically find. So this is an ingressing uh, cell membrane. So that's a lipid bilayer. Uh, and in, and that, that would be the cell wall. And what you see in these tomograms is we see a very dense uh, sort of granular structure that straddles these, uh, these membrane. And you can segment these out and then tilt them. So what you see in cyan, uh, is this ingressing membrane. So that's a lipid bilayer. And that's not a cartoon representation, but actually that's a real uh, lipid bilayer. And surrounding that lipid bilayer, uh, what you see is this long uh, actin filaments that actually nicely straddle uh, these ingressing membrane, right? So, so with these kind of examples and numerous such examples, it allows us to look at much finer details of uh, of what these links structures are. We know that they are now made up of almost about uh, 50, uh, say typically about 45 to 50 actin filaments. These filaments are very, very tightly packed together. 
So the distance between uh, these actin filaments are typically in the order of about uh, 10, 10 to 12 nanometers. So it's extremely dense packing. Uh, and there is, uh, I mean, they're, they're predominantly straight filaments. The typical numbers uh, are about, uh, say, 35 to 40. They remain invariant. Uh, but, but interestingly, they are actually not directly uh, linked to the cell, mem uh, cell, cell membrane. So there is a stereotypic uh, separation of, so if, if you look at it uh, in a tilt, you'll find that these are these actin filament uh, network, and this is the ingressing membrane. And there is this gap of about 30 nanometers between these actin filaments and the membrane. And a still outstanding question in the field is that what exactly links these actin filaments uh, to the membrane. And again, in collaboration with Matt um, and, and some, some of the newer grad students in our lab, we have taken a directed approach of doing, uh, you know, taking some, some, some of these EM tags uh, and to figure out as what sits between these actin filaments and the membrane and what links uh, these things together, thereby what transmit these forces that actomycin uh, structure generates to the membrane which would lead to these link contraction. Uh, so, so that's uh, second aspect of the work, but uh, the third or the more interesting aspect of what we do is to take a more in vitro approach to, under, to, to understand or study this problem. And I see that I'm already sort of close to the, I've, I've taken up more than one fourth, uh, three fourth of my time. So I'll, I'll rush through some of this later stuff. So we also have, you know, we've also managed to isolate these uh, these complex structures and to study them in vitro. And the way we do it is, uh, so we strip these cells of cell wall. We have to engineer the way to, uh, um, to figure out the way to uh, coax these cells to form these actomycin structure. Now, remember these actomycin structures are actually made up of 140 different proteins and possibly millions of protein molecules that come together to form. So these are rather multi-molecular structure and they have to be linked to the membrane. So it's a uh, little non-trivial to, to, to isolate them in a functional state, but uh, some time ago, I mean, we managed to do that. Uh, so, so this is how these isolated rings looks like. Uh, what you see uh, stain uh, here in magenta is cell membrane. So it's actually an FM staining and all kinds of membranes would stain. And you see this ghost of membrane and a rather intact looking ring inside these ghosts, right? So we can isolate them out of the cell, but, and we also could show that now you can activate them and you can make them contract outside the cell. So take them out, uh, add functionalized ATP, and then these rings actually constrict very, very beautifully. Uh, the only difference is that inside the cell, these rings would have taken about 20 minutes to constrict, but once you add isolate, uh, once you add ATP to the isolated rings, they cons constrict almost thirty-fold faster. They constrict within a minute, uh, and you know we, we sort of characterize this constriction. I won't go get into the details, but we unequivocally prove that this constriction is indeed uh, dependent on type two myosin, uh, uh, because when you pre-treat these isolated rings uh, with blebistatin specific inhibitor of type 2 mycin and then add ATP, then these links don't quite constrict, right? But that's not very surprising. I mean, it's an atomycin structure. People have sort of suggested that mycin is, does play an important role in, in, in these link contraction. What was interesting uh, that we found from our study was that actin depolymerization and disassembly is actually not required for, for these link contraction. Uh, so, so if, if you block these actin uh, filaments, so, so the logic is that the rings, when they are large at the start of contraction, and if you look at the rings when they are much smaller, these actin filaments, people had suggested that they get shorter and shorter as these rings constrict. And that was the mode of uh, the modality for contraction that people have proposed. But what we found was that when you stabilize these actin filaments and uh, both using electron microscopy as well as using biochemical methods, 
we have showed that these uh, these actin filaments are indeed stabilized by this drug uh, uh, called jaspicinone light. Uh, even in presence of that, these links contract in vitro, just uh, like a, with near normal kinetics as it would without this drug treatment, implying that these actin filaments do necessarily need to shorten. What's actually happening is that these actin filaments walk past each other and then they get separated out and they sort of get feed out in the cell matrix as these links constrict. What was also new and interesting, uh, and I added a new dimension to this whole uh, process of contraction was that we could find that if you sort of jam up these actin filaments and you add molecules like alpha actin in the same molecule that I introduced you to, uh, to you during the, the, the genetic part of the uh, lecture. Uh, so that if you take copious amounts of actin sort of cross-linking proteins, then they show a nice dose-dependent inhibition of blocking of actomycin contraction in vitro. So if you add uh, any of the known actin cross-linking protein to concentrations which are similar to cellular concentrations, uh, then you see these rings contract, but this contraction is a little slower. So normally unperturbed ring would contract within uh, 40 to 50 seconds, but these rings take about two minutes to contract. But if you add about threefold uh, or, or you know, three or five fold of normal cellular concentration, then they completely jam these actomycin rings and they do not contract at all. So this, this, this and other uh, data implied that, uh, you know, besides uh, actomycin activity, you also need to regulate actin cross-linking activity and that dynamic actin cross-linking activity is absolutely important for the proper link contraction. Uh, I think I am already at the, so I've sort of taken up a fair bit of time. So I'll, I'll rush to some of the data and we can, you know, we can extend these studies by using, you know, photoconvertible uh, form of energy sources whereby you can activate these actomycin structure by using a, a, a modified form of by derivative of active ATP, which can, you know, using just flashes of light, you can make it into active and inactive forms. And using that again, I mean, I'll sort of skip through many of these uh, slides. I, I'll just go to this. Uh, using this, we, what we have shown is that you just need the actomycin structure at the early phase of contraction. Just once you start contracting and then you inactivate ATP and you take away all the energy source, then these links would still continue to contract a bit though at, at a slightly slower pace, right? So, so this again implies that actomycin structure or actomycin contractility for these links are required only at the early phases. And later on, uh, just the actin dynamics itself can sustain these contraction. Uh, just to give you another flavor, I mean, what, what we are trying to do now is we're trying to reconstitute this whole process. So we, we take uh, these components since we already have a good parts list and we encapsulate them in, in artificial uh, by uh, vesicles and, and uh, liposomes. Uh, and what we can do is then uh, begin and start to see these uh, structures start assembling uh, filamentous structures first. And eventually we could figure out a way to form actomycin ring-like structures in, in these isolated vesicles. And, and these rings uh, can in principle assemble and that assembly is actually size dependent uh, for these vesicles. So when the vesicles are larger than 10, uh, their diameters are larger than 10 microns, then these vesicles would not form links. They only form these uh, sort of isolated structures of actin and myosin. But within the correct uh, permissible range, most of these uh, vesicles actually do form links. Uh, and we are sort of figuring out as how exactly uh, to, to make this contractile and how, what more can we study. And finally, again, I mean, with, in, in, uh, with the help of our collaborators, we've sort of done course grain simulation of this whole process to figure out uh, as what are the mycin strokes, how exactly 
uh, a power stroke uh, translate into uh, a larger body uh, you know structure how does that how does the force get this uh, i mean transmitted uh, to the membrane uh, and again i mean that's something that we we published a couple of years ago uh, in the paper then in MBOC. So, I mean, again, I, because of time, we can't quite get into it, but I'll just leave you with this simulation uh, movies where we can actually, uh, I mean, sort of uh, do a fairly detailed uh, simulation of, of these actomycin structure. And as these uh, things actually contract, they bring in these uh, flexible plasma membrane uh, with it. I guess I'm sort of used up most of my time, so I should stop here. Uh, so I and, and acknowledge the people uh, who contributed to this work. So Shamo uh, and Aditi, contrib Shamo contributed to the, the ultrastructure work that I showed you. Uh, Aditi contributed to the, 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 the genetics work. Uh, uh, Swisti, who was a postdoc in the lab, uh, uh, she did uh, many of these in vitro work uh, along with Shubham. Uh, and this, uh, some of these in vitro work was uh, initiated in Mohan's lab uh, when he was in TLL earlier. He was now moved to Warwick Medical School uh, grant, and we collaborated quite extensively, uh, and, and with particularly with Matt and Lamb in his lab uh, from Caltech on ultrastructure work. Uh, Ishe uh, Mabuchi uh, from University of Tokyo, as well as Ryota O'Hara from Hokkaido University. We do a lot of work on, on chemical uh, sort of alteration of these ring like structures, which I didn't quite get time to talk to you about. And finally, I should uh, thank uh, the fundings from DAE and TIFR, uh, as well as Welcome Trust, uh, India Alliance, and Japan Society for Promotion of Science, as well as NIH uh, joint grant with uh, grant. Right. So I should stop here and I should. Uh, let you guys some time to ask question if I have any time left. So let me stop talking now. Yes, sir. Thank you for such an informative session. Now, sir, we have a few doubts. Answer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like you said, sir, once the contraction of the rings start, then they're not even the need of ATP. So, like, is the initiation dependent on the concentration of ATP? Uh, no. So, cellular, intercellular ATP concentrations uh, uh, throughout this process remains constant. Uh, we know that, and we, have, we and many others actually, it's been known for almost three to four decades now. Uh, so, so ATP is not limited. Uh, we, what the idea of that stuff it goes. Uh, so, it turns out that inside the cell, ATP is not limiting, and it may indeed be ATP dependent, but it need not be. So, atomize, so actin uh, dynamics and turnover can also the contraction, but that force is just not enough to initiate the contraction. In fact, we've done some, some very recent but preliminary biophysical studies or rather biomechanics studies where we have calculated forces and know that the initial contraction forces that these rings generate, we, we did this by soft uh, litho lithography techniques where we sort of pull these rings into pillars and we measure, measure the kind of forces. And we know that initial contraction typically is in the order of about 800 piconewton forces. But later on, the contraction actually requires so the kind of force sort of drops down to almost about an order of magnitude. And that is it's, that, that sort of explains why initiation requires acquired function. All right, thank you, sir. And now, sir, uh, we have one more question. Like, sir, it says that the, the kids want to know that what role can graphene play in the in vitro work, sir, to which what you are Sorry, uh, can you repeat it? What role can... What play? Sir, 
can so graphene graphene so do we have any idea so, what so role can not... graphene play in the winter in winter work so we have we 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 have, we do some material uh, sort of uh, we do use uh, certain material we definitely don't uh, use graphene because uh, i mean we we use some soft uh, soft materials like pdms uh, pillars because the kind of forces that we are interested in measuring or the kind of forces that these macromolecular assemblages actually generate are in tunes of uh, you know i mean uh, nanonewtons so you know i mean about a few hundreds of nanonewtons Uh, so so that's why you need a very very soft material to probe uh, probe these kind of forces uh, so we don't quite use graphene but you we do use other materials to other polymer materials to to, to understand certain things, certain aspects of this process thank you sir thank you sir and so one more question would be like so this actin ring contraction does it proceed in a 2d plane or a 3d plane now so so in in their life it actually constricts in 3d and we have uh, so again i mean we i don't have uh, simulation movies but i could have showed you that this is actually 3d the whole structure itself is 3d and we have uh, a fairly good uh, em sort of data to exactly show how does it move so, so it is definitely in 3d Okay, sir. It has a diameter than a width. Okay, the ring sir. itself has a width of about 150 nano, uh, 150 microns. So it's it's fairly thick. These 50 actin filaments assemble into a 150 uh, micron thick structure. Yes, okay, sir. So I guess we're done with the any queries okay. and doubts. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And then the next session will now begin at one. And so, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you for the great and interactive session.